So this week, we're going to be back in Luke chapter 2, verses 39 through 52. So if you would, if you have a Bible, please open it to that passage. If you don't have a Bible, there's a pew Bible in front of you, and that passage is on page 858. And so we are looking at part two of a series that Martin started last week called Parenting in Wisdom and Grace. And last week, Martin spoke to us about Jesus and his childhood. He focused on the fact that Jesus is human. And as a human, he advanced in wisdom. He grew physically. He became stronger in spirit. He was filled with wisdom. And then the favor of God was upon him. But Martin also showed us that Jesus Christ, in his humanity, was at home with himself. He was at home with his parents, but he was also at home with his father as he went about the father's business in the temple. And so as we look at this passage, we're going to look at this passage in a different way. We're going to look at this passage through the eyes of Jesus' parents. We're going to see this passage through Mary and Joseph. And we're going to talk about increasing in wisdom as we parent and disciple our children. And so before we read this passage, let me just say on the front end that Dylan and I have not parented our children perfectly. There is no perfect. We have made mistakes. We have learned as we go. And for, for many of you in this room, we're all in different stages of parenting our own children. And for us, we are still seeking to increase in wisdom and grace as we parent adult children. And we begin to understand what they need from us as their parents now that they are out of elementary school, out of high school, and uh, almost out of college. Um, so again, if you would turn to Luke chapter 2, verses 39 through 52, let me pray, and then we will read this passage together. Heavenly Father, as we open your word this morning, I pray that we would hear from you, that you would speak to us through your spirit, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see. So Father, as we read your word, would you speak to us now, for your servants are listening. Amen. This is Luke chapter 2, verses 39 through 52. When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grass withers and the flowers fail, but the word of our God stand forever. So, as you continue to get to know me, one of the things that you're going to learn about me is that I love to watch the game of football. And so, what I love about the game of football is you have two coaches and you have two teams. And they have one mission. And the mission is to get the ball across the goal line it is to score and to win the game. But there's these other people on the field called refs. And the refs, they're responsible for making sure that the coaches and the teams play according to the rules of the book. 
Everyone on the field is submitting to the authority of the rules of football. When you and I seek to increase in wisdom and in grace as we parent our children or as we walk in every other part of life, we have to look to the Word of God. If you look at the Westminster Confession of Faith, you see the description of the Bible. The Bible is described as being the only rule for faith and life. The scriptures are described as being authoritative. And they're authoritative over our lives, not because of the testimony of man, but because they are the very testimony of God. That's what makes them authoritative. And so when you and I come to the scriptures to learn how do we parent our children in in wisdom and grace, how do we seek to disciple them, you and I must submit ourselves to the authority of God's word. And as we do that, we're going to see three things in this text. We're going to see that we must live according to God's plan and not our own. We must understand our child's greatest need and how differently they're made. And we must be prepared as parents and really as followers of Christ to make mistakes and know that we're not alone. And so this first This first point that if you and I are going to increase in wisdom and grace as we parent our children, we submit to God's authority by raising them according to God's plan and not our own. We look to verse 39. If you look at verse 39, you're going to see that Mary and Joseph, they had just returned home from completing the requirements of the law. They had just returned home from performing everything that was necessary for them According to the law of the Lord is what the scripture says. So what did they complete? They completed circumcision. circumcision. Jesus had to be circumcised on the eighth day. There was a time of purification that Mary had to go through as uh, having a child. Something that was required for a woman after childbirth. And we see those requirements in Genesis 17 in Leviticus 12. But that phrase, according to, is really important. Because in the original language, it means conformity to a standard. And so the mom and dad of Jesus Christ, the parents of Jesus Christ, were seeking to raise their kids in conformity to a standard. So what was the standard? The standard was not popular opinion. The standard was not what the neighbor is doing. The standard is not what the local school is doing. The standard is what God says to do in his word. That's the standard. We're to raise our children according to God's plan and not our own. His standard, His word, what He says to do in His word. But if you look at also verse 41, verse 41 and 42, Luke also points out something else that's really important. He points out that Mary and Joseph went to Jerusalem every year for Passover. This was their annual routine. This was something they did on a regular basis. And that's when he was an infant. But then fast forward and you see Jesus is 12 years old. And you see the same devotion of the parents to bring their child to Passover, to Jerusalem, according to custom. In that word, custom is important as well. That word custom means it's a habit. It's a habit that's required by law, but it is a habit. And so if you look, if you were to look at uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 39, the same word for custom is used to describe Jesus saying, he went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. We also see it in Hebrews 10, 25, when the word is used to describe the habit of gathering together in worship. It is a practice, it is a habit of us to gather together in corporate worship on Sunday mornings. And it was a habit and a practice for Mary and Joseph to go up to Jerusalem, to take their child, to go to the place where they would worship. It was what this family did. 
It was a date on the calendar that the rest of their life was scheduled around. And so worship for them was not something added in or sprinkled into their routine. Their regular routine was a life of worship. And then every other part of their life flowed from that. They were raising their child according to God's plan and not their own by doing what God said and including him in their daily routine. And remember why they're going up to Jerusalem. They're going up to to Jerusalem for the Passover. It's the Passover that they're going to celebrate. This is a time where where God, we celebrate that God had freed them from from the hand of the Egyptians. It's a time where the ancestors, the mothers, the fathers, and the grandparents got to say to their children, this is what God has done in my life. This is what God is doing in my life. This is what it means to have faith in Christ and what it means for you to do that as you walk throughout your life. Deuteronomy 6, 7 says that you shall teach them diligently. This is the commands of God. Teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. We are to be talking to our children, to our grandchildren about our faith, how it intersects with the rest of life in our daily conversations. When you rise, when you sit, when you're at home, when you're not at home, when you're in the car, it's something you do every day. It's included in your routine. One of the favorite stories that I have about my grandmother is when we used to go to the beach, we used to take my grandmother to the beach almost every year. And I remember one specific year when we were under the age of 10, my sisters and me were under the age of 10, And she called us out to the beach and she said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your finger, dip it in the salt water and put it on your tongue. And then she said, I want you to wiggle your toes in the sand. And then she said, I want you to close your eyes and feel the breeze upon your face. And she was doing this because she was telling us at the same time, this is what God has created. This is what God means. God has created all these things. The stories of our faith, how God has worked in our lives, is so important for our children and our grandchildren to hear. But what if you don't have any grandchildren? What if you don't have any children? What if you don't have any nieces or nephews? Well, the reality is is that if if you've sat in these pews and you have witnessed baptisms as a member of this church, you may have said yes to one or both of these congregational vows. The first one says this, do you as a member of this congregation assume responsibility with these parents for the spiritual nurture of this child? Do you commit yourself to set a godly example before this child and to provide as far as you are able all that is necessary that this child may one day confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? When we say yes to that promise, we are saying we're going to influence a child in the world that we live in, in the church that we live in, in the body of Christ. We're going to influence that child in a way that points them to Christ. So the question is, how are you doing with this? How are you doing with raising your children, raising your grandchildren, teaching your children, teaching your grandchildren, discipling the children in a way that points them to Jesus Christ. How are you doing with that? Do you find yourself scheduling Jesus into the rest of your week? Or is worship a priority for you where you look at the calendar to ensure that these days are non-negotiable? Are you as persistent with your daily devotion and your prayers and your family devotion as you are with your daily workout or your daily time of catching up with the news in the rest of the world. Discipling our children in wisdom and grace, increasing in wisdom and grace 
means that we live according to his plan and not our own. But it also means that we must seek to understand our child's greatest need and how differently they are made. If you look again with me at that passage, if you look at verse 40, you're going to see Jesus described as a child that is growing and becoming strong in spirit. Again, he's filled with wisdom. But Luke uses another description, and he says that Jesus Christ, the child, the infant, has the favor of God upon him. That means that he had the grace of God upon him. And if you flip a couple of pages back to Luke chapter 1, verse 80, Luke chapter 1, verse 80 is describing another child. That child is John the Baptist. And if you look at how Luke described John the Baptist, he said, and the child grew and became strong in spirit. John the Baptist is not described as having the favor or the grace of God upon him. That description has been held for Jesus. Why is that? Why is it that Jesus is described as having the grace of God upon him? Well, see, Jesus Christ was conceived of the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Virgin Mary, and he is yet without sin. And if you compare him to John the Baptist, John the Baptist had two earthly parents. So John the Baptist had a very corrupt nature just like you and me that was passed down to him from Adam. And he had it as an infant. He had it from conception. As Paul tells us in Romans 5.12, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. Jesus Christ conceived of the Holy Spirit John the Baptist, corrupt nature, passed down to him from Adam. There's a difference. One theologian describes it this way. He says, even though Christ has assumed a human nature, which is finite and limited and which began to exist in time as person, as self, Christ does not in Scripture stand on the side of the creature, but on the side of God. He partakes of God's virtues and of his works he possesses the same divine nature. Jesus and John the Baptist were alike in that they were both of human form. But they were different in that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Without sin, conceived of the Holy Spirit. When you and I seek to disciple our children in a way that points them to Christ, one of the things that we must understand is that they are similar. Within your family, your children are similar. There may be mannerisms. There may be looks that are similar to their parents. But there are differences in their personalities. There are differences in their desires. There are differences in the gifts that God has given them. There's differences in the way they show love and the way they receive love. And there are differences in what makes them anxious or joyful or content or fearful. If we want to parent and disciple our children well, we must understand that how, how completely differently they are made. But we also must understand their greatest need. At the core of who John the Baptist was and who Jesus Christ was, at the core of their difference, we see their greatest need. The greatest need of Jesus Christ was for him to accomplish the will of his Father on earth. And the way he did that was he came to earth to save his people from their sin. He came to earth to reconcile you and me back to the Father so that we could have a right relationship with him. He came to earth to take on the penalty for my sin and your sin. So what was John the Baptist's greatest need? John the Baptist's greatest need was he needed that Savior. He had that corrupt nature. He needs the Savior. He needs his sins removed. He, need, he needs his relationship with his Father reconciled. That is his greatest need. In a book called Grace-Based Parenting by Dr. Tim Kimmel, 
he states that the greatest need of each child is a need for security, significance, and a need for strength. Security in knowing how deeply they are loved. Significance in knowing that they have a purpose. And strength in knowing that they have a hope that is strong. Friends, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Security. Knowing that our children, we are loved. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God loved you and me. God loves our children, the children that he has given us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross. That we would live forever. Significance. You and I and the children that we have were created for a purpose. And that purpose is to glorify God. The Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism, question number one, says, what is the chief end of man? The purpose, the chief purpose of man. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And we can break that down into different areas in our life. What is the chief end of man in your job? What is the chief end of man in your school? What is the chief end of man if you're on this athletic team, this cheer team, whatever team you're on? What is the chief end of man in the illness that you have right now? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And so the question is, is how do we do that? How do we glorify God? In a job, in work, in school. How do we do that? That's our purpose. That's our significance. It's to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But thirdly, strength. A hope that is strong. Our hope is not in some cool saying. Our hope is not that we will win a championship. Our hope is in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that one day, when we stand in front of him face to face, we will hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. In order for us to disciple our children, we live according to God's plan and not our own. We understand that their greatest need and our greatest need is for a savior. And we also understand how completely differently each one of them is made. But lastly, if we want to disciple our children well, we must be prepared to make mistakes and know that we're not alone. So as you look at the narrative that follows about Mary and, Jesus, Mary and Joseph returning from Jerusalem, Mary and Joseph have gone about a day's journey that's about 20 miles. So it's a full day that they've gone from Jerusalem before they notice that Jesus is actually missing. Or that Jesus is not with Joseph and Jesus is not with Mary. See, Mary and Joseph were at different places in the caravan. So they just assumed that, one, that Jesus was with the other. But then at the end of the day is when they figured out that Jesus is not with them. And so then they began to search among family and acquaintances to say, hey, have you seen our son? Do you know where Jesus is? They hadn't seen him, and so they go back to Jerusalem. I don't know if you've ever had that feeling before of not knowing exactly where each one of your children are. I know that, that, that Dylan and I have felt it when our youngest was four years old. We were driving to the store. We, we checked to see that everyone was in the car. We truly believed that everyone was in the car. We got in the car, we drove 10 minutes down the road and realized that our four-year-old was not with us. It is a horrible feeling of worry, of fear. And images begin to rush into your mind about what could be happening. Where could she be? Is she in the street? Is she not? That feeling is a pit-in-the-stomach feeling, and you, you don't know what to do with it. 
other than speed down the street, break every speed law, and make it back to your house, which is what we did. It's what I did. It wasn't we. Um, when we got back, she was, she was just standing inside the door, waiting. But that feeling, that feeling was so horrible. These parents, they made a mistake, and they just assumed one, one or the other knew where Jesus was. But here's, what, here's why I point this out. The reason I want you to understand that we all are going to make mistakes is because I want you to know that your kids need to know that it's okay to make mistakes. Your children need to know that their parents aren't perfect. Your children need to know that it's okay that if they mess up, there, yes, there'll be consequences. That's not, that's not the issue. The question is, is do they know? Do they know when you've made a mistake? The last time you made a mistake, did it impact your family? Did it impact someone else outside your family? What did you do with that? Did you go to your family and say, I'm sorry for making that mistake. Would you please forgive me? Because it's, see, it's, it's within those four walls of your home that they learn how to be vulnerable. It's within those four walls of your home that they learn how to apologize, how to say I'm sorry, and what forgiveness looks like. So when, when, we, when we are real with our mistakes, it gives our kids the okay to say, hey, you know what, if I make a mistake... It's not, it's not going to be the end of the world. But the other thing I want to point out to you is that when, Jesus and, when, when Joseph and Mary noticed that Jesus was not there, the first place they went to was to family and friends. And these family and friends, the family and friends were not just any family and friends. These were family and friends that were on their way back from worship. They were on their way back from Jerusalem. This was the community of God. They went to the community of God when they were struggling, when they were hurting. And my guess is with a crowd this size, there are some people in here who have the same struggles that are going on right now. Some of you may be at point A in your struggle of trying to figure out how this is going to work. Some of you may be further along down the road in that struggle and God may be using that in your life to help encourage the other person as they work through it by themselves. So we need to be willing to not only let our children know that it's okay to make a mistake because your parents, we are not perfect. But we also need to look to the body of Christ for being built up, for being strengthened. And so my prayer for us my prayer for all of us in this room if, is if you have not received Christ by faith, if you have not trusted him by faith, if you, don't, if you haven't had that need for security, knowing that you're loved, that significance, knowing you have a purpose and that strength, knowing that you have a hope that's strong, if you have not had that satisfied in you, I invite you today to trust Christ as your Savior. And your greatest needs, the need for a Savior, the need for significance, the need to, to know that you're loved, will be completely satisfied in your relationship with Jesus Christ. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.